And hello, everyone. Welcome to The Real Estate Show on KCMX News Media 880. Pete Belcaster and Joe Brent, The Real Estate Guys, with you today. And thanks for joining us here on KCMX. My goodness, the new year is here, and away we go uh, in the real estate market that is uh, uh, doing, you know, for January, which is usually a slow time, you know, December, January, uh, there's a lot of activity going on, Joe, out there. And we want people to realize that there's still people looking. There's still houses being sold, but our market has changed. And so we're going to get to that a little bit in the meantime, right? And, you know, I've showed shown 10 houses in the right. last 10 days. A couple of different clients moved out looking pretty well. And, and there's definitely activity still yeah. to be had out there. There's more inventory coming. Yep. Things that's like that. so there's that's more, why they're getting there's, out. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's more choice, more competition <clears throat> as well. That's what they've been waiting for. The fellow here in the middle of us today is Gary Turner, who's a longtime uh, trial lawyer, attorney in the Rogue Valley. Uh, Joining us here, you first of all, welcome to our show. Thank it's you. It's great nice to have to you here. here. You are par- you are part of the of a, of, of a group of attorneys who we have had. Uh, Chris Hearn has been on our show mm-hmm. once before, uh, and Jack Davis, and in you, and you just you guys, you guys handle this a lot. You talk a lot about real estate, don't you? <laughs> like well, we, we do. We do. We do every every week for sure. We have a, a meeting, and every day. Uh, frequently, we're yeah, talking you, about it. You do that all the time. Okay, that's right. it's, it, yeah. So it's 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 amazing how often real estate uh, comes up and be part of uh, of our conversation. That's for sure. What uh, you, you've been trying, Lord? So you tell us what you've done in in kind of some of this stuff because you you've been around a long time and to do this. Well, I I grew up in California and went to California schools, and you know I'm a Cal Bear. Yeah. Yes, I, I know that. Yeah, we, we we always forgive you for that. Yeah, right? I, I, you have to. And uh, so uh, I practiced law in Stockton, California for 13 years. And then in 1985, I came up here. 85. And so I've been practicing law for 45 years and uh, been up in the Rogue Valley now for 33, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 34. Long, long, you, were, you were a year behind so, Pete and I to arrive in the Rogue Valley. Yeah, right, okay. around, that, right around that same time, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah, we didn't come as attorneys, though. You know, we, we didn't have that kind of skill <laughs> level when we got here. But uh, So anyway, my, my career for the first 25 years was almost all litigation, tri- actual trial work. I actually mm-hmm. tried cases. <clears throat> and um, so I have a lot of experience handling disputes. And starting about 15 years ago, I started doing more and more estate planning work. Mm-hmm. Did a lot of real estate work along the way and still do some, but my partner Jack mm-hmm. is the, the expert in the county, and so I tend to refer stuff to him yeah. because he's so good at it. But I've, I've become an estate planner. I deal with real estate issues in the planning process mm-hmm. with my clients, but I also have a really good understanding of how disputes ripen, where they come from, and what happens when people mm-hmm. get into them. And, and, and no matter what you're... <clears throat> and what, how to resolve and, them. And, and resolving them is the issue. So tell, tell us just what are some of the... What are the big things that, that, dis, that real estate is in dispute with? I mean, we're not talking about the transaction generally here, but uh, that's, it's beyond that, I guess. But what are the things that you see, uh, Gary, that are out there that can come up uh, for people? Well, there's uh, easements. An easement is the right that one person has to use another person's land in some way. Mm -hmm. It might be for a driveway. It might be for a view. There's many different types of easements, although the most common ones are to to go across somebody's land to traverse it. And, you know, you get these uh, people get sideways with each other, and somebody comes home and tries to use the easement, and his neighbor whose property is has put up a locked gate and mm-hmm. won't let him through and now you know now we have uh, the gloves are off and people are pretty angry and, and, and easements are a big issue you know because we, we've heard lots of stories but don't you have doesn't a person have the right uh, the way I understand the I'm not a lawyer uh, that don't you have the right to be have access to your property if it's behind something or you have to when you e- buy easement, it you have an easement, easement aren't those, rights stay with the property Despite the transfer of ownership, right? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, most almost all right. easements run with the land, meaning they right they the are land, right. perpetual easements right. rather than you and I are neighbors and and I give you the right to go across my yeah. land just as long as you live. That can be done, but that's mm. very uncommon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, easements they're embedded in the land almost always, and they're created by written documents. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of situations where there is usage of another person's property that happens over years or sometimes decades, old roads that go across a bunch of different pieces of property, and everybody uses them, and all of a sudden, 
somebody doesn't want that to happen anymore, mm. and and then you end up with a problem because yeah. those are those are not actual rights that are created in a recorded document that's recorded in the official records. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so a, a, a true easement is one that's been created in a written document and then recorded in the official records of the county. It's recorded on, when you do that what, preliminary title report, don't, that's when that's when all <coughs> this comes out, yeah. right? If there's an yeah. easement on the property. And it's been really it's interesting to me sometimes is that when you're, when you're dealing as a real estate broker, uh, when that comes out, because the, the, the owners, amazingly how many times don't even know that there's an easement on their property. Mm -hmm. you, see, have you ever seen that? Well, sure. I mean, if you look at, uh, I bought a piece of uh, rural property one time, and I figured there wouldn't be any easements on that. And <laughs> yeah. there were like nine <laughs> oh, easements for yeah. phone companies and power companies. Right, and, right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Frequently, utilities. Uh, utilities have easements across your property, although they're not currently using them. Or, or they yeah. may, you know, but they have reserved the right to use your property if they need yeah. to. Yeah, you know, one of the easements that I, I got into, it, the only one actually, I think in my years of doing this, was an easement that was um, south of Ashland, and it was involving the railroad. The railroad, we, we, had, we had selling a piece of property, and the, when you cross the, the, the railroad there, you're going to assist you right. up the mountain there, the, the railroad wanted the new buyer to pay $4,200 for an easement to cross the railroad, which they've already been doing for X amount of years. Okay, Mr. Attorney, how do I solve that one? Would you tell me that one? Because I about, I about blew up. I didn't even know what to do. You know, what do you do? Well, there, you know, you can negotiate with whoever you need to, to obtain the right from. Okay. Um, Okay. And oh, I get a little closer. There you go, All right, there you go, there you go. So hopefully you can work that out by negotiation. And typically, uh, if you're getting something that isn't officially yours already, you have to pay something for that. Okay. Um, there are, uh, you've heard the term probably adverse possession. Mm -hmm. adverse That's possession, a term yeah. that applies to when someone is using someone else's property in, in a manner that where they believe that they actually own the property. That happens a lot with fence lines. People assume fence lines are on a boundary uh, on line, a boundary but they line, they're not. very often are not on the yeah. boundary line. So it might be 10 feet into somebody's property and then the next door neighbor is using that whole 10 feet up to the fence, okay. even though they, and they believe it's their backyard or whatever it is. When in fact, by deed and by legal description, it's the property of the neighbor. Yeah. So, um, the you can develop a right to use someone else's property by the the uh, doctrine of prescriptive easement so it's not an official granted easement that's in a document somewhere but by your use in accordance with the terms that you have to establish to get a prescriptive easement you can go you can hopefully get the neighbor to agree that you have an easement and then you come to a lawyer we draw up the draw easement up the and easement. describe it in the way it needed to be described and then record it the alternative to that is filing a lawsuit and having yeah. a judge mm -hmm. decide whether yeah. you have a right. And there must be think, think, there must be thousands of easements out there. Yeah, it's, I mean thousands of them on properties, especially rural properties, more so maybe than, than in town properties. I, I would think, but uh, there's thousands of them out there. So now I've heard this one that uh, if you are using, say, you're using an easement or you're using someone's property to cross, as you say, and you've been doing it for 20 years, does that does that isn't there, isn't there a rule that, you, that automatically goes with that, uh, that, that easement goes with that? Is that true? Or, or well, again, if, if, if the, the pathway that's being, you know, road or whatever okay. it is that's being used is described in a document that says that the user on the adjacent property has the right to go over the, okay. we call it the burdened property. Yeah, but if there's not one. If there's not one, one that's it's the problem. just if it's a matter of custom and, and usage, it's been done for a long time, but there's no memorialization of it in a written document See, that's recorded. And, and the that's, key is you got to have it written down. Yeah. Isn't that what we always say? you got to have recorded, it written yeah. down, recorded, even if it's on a piece of paper, but you got to document and, it or you just have no standing when you come in to see the attorney. What do you, you got nothing when there. I, when I see prescriptive easements in the title reports or in the client's question, that's when I think it's time to call Gary. <laughs> as soon as I hear that yeah. uh, that term, because yeah. that's that's when it's, it's starting to get yeah. a little, little more complicated than we are trained right. for. Yeah, the easements know, are tough. They're tough. And, and there's no question if, if there's a written easement 
uh, that's recorded. There's right. no question that the easement owner has the right to use his neighbor's property. Mm-hmm. Um, there may still be disputes about the scope of the use that can be, uh, you mm-hmm. know, can be employed in that situation. But um, the problem with any custom and usage situation is that there's always going to be two sides to the story. Mm -hmm. The person that's using his neighbor's property thinks, hey, we've been doing it for 20 years. How can you stop me? And the person who owns the property that's being used says, well, I can stop you because I want to. (laughs) Because you don't have a written recorded easement giving you the right to do what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And And then it gets into a horse race and an argument. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I can just tell you that, that there's never... I have... In 42 years of trying cases, yeah. I have never guaranteed someone that they would win because yeah. you'd be foolish to do so. Yeah, and if you uh, do get into it's it, it's up to a jury or a judge, and stuff happens mm-hmm. in trial that yep. uh, you didn't right. expect. And mm-hmm. so there's many uncertainties, yeah. interpretations. And, yeah. And, and if you do get into kind of a dispute, especially about boundary lines or easements, is to get a surveyor, get a, get a survey of the property done. Because I've seen, we've seen things, uh, uh, you know, uh, pins. I guess you know, property pins sure. have been placed, and people have moved them. I didn't, I didn't even realize that you could do that. But I guess people move them and stuff. And so, if there's issues, don't take it into your own hands. But really, sure. you can get a survey done. You can go to the title company to find out about easements if they're there. Uh, you know, but don't do it yourself because you're going to just kind of end up in a in a bad place. I think so. Uh, but they're out there, and you want to make sure that you do it right. And they, they sound scary to potential buyers sometimes. Oh, well, you get, no. just, it, it, <laughs> Buyers are not going to get involved. Right. I don't care. They're not going to get involved if you've got a dispute going on over an easement. Right. right? They're, yeah. they're just going to walk away and go find another place. So if you're into that part of selling that, you've got to make sure as you, when you list the property that those things are taken care of. And Don't think it most, big, better. most of them are recorded in place and for the good of everybody involved and uh, they're uh, they come to dispute but and you can, that's and not it, the it norm, just works but, yeah, yeah. when it's written it's what what really works in our culture is having things that are certain and well defined and well described as complicated as all the laws yeah. are and I I told Pete the other day when I when I <laughs> had a coke with him that we that the statutes of Oregon are this wide in the books you know in small print thin pages there's there's yeah. a lot of laws on the books but we can circumvent that and the problems that those laws might otherwise create by having clear written agreements clear. about the things that we do yeah that's not to say that handshakes don't work they probably work more than they don't but boy if you have a handshake agreement and it's not produced to writing I mean you can once it, yeah. once there's a dispute People remember things yeah. very differently depending on which side you're on. And you can end the easements if both sides agree to it. Isn't that true also? If you wanted to end an easement yeah. wasn't used, you can you can actually agree to it and, and release the easement, and you correct? You can vacate the easement vacate if, the, easement. if the, easement. the two property owners involved, or sometimes Agreed. there's more than two, but yeah. if everybody in, in yeah. affected by the easement agrees, and yeah. then you record that abandonment yeah. or vacation of the easement and now it doesn't exist anymore and that's something to think about if you have a bunch of those on a property is mm-hmm. to get rid of those mm-hmm. you know don't don't bog yourself down with things that are going to stop the sale and, and easements would be one way to do that hey well we've got to take a break here and come back we're with gary turner by the way attorney today's show presented by the rogue valley association of realtors when we come back we're going to talk about estate planning with you and, and the things you need to know to get ready to do that the estate planning is so important for so many people we're coming right back after this the middle is Gary Turner, representing today's show presented by the Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. And I know Jack Davis, uh, your partner, uh, is an instructor for RVAR on these kinds of topics about land use issues and stuff like that, marijuana issues. So you guys are right in the middle <laughs> of all we the are. big stuff, aren't you, going, on, going Jack, on around us? Jack made a presentation over at the Board of Realtors this afternoon. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, Joe goes to planning commission meetings and See, knows and hears what's going on uh, around. Uh, I think they put a price tag today, by the way, on those apartments in Ashland down by the football mm, stadium yeah. that everybody's talking about the crammed in there, and they're spending three fifty to four hundred thousand yeah. dollars for them as well. Uh, sorry, this, you said for apartments. This, for their, their condos. I condos. mean, they're, they're, yep. I'm sorry, they're condominiums. I'm sorry, condominiums. <laughs> condominiums. <laughs> Last week in real estate. Okay, the second week of January. Uh, people say the market's the market's not doing well. Sixty three new listings last week, uh, sixty the week before. So that's that's up. Seventy eight pending sales last week and forty three closed sales in Jackson County. 
a little bit less in, in Josephine County. The biggest story probably, Joe, is that uh, our, our, you know, our market talk that we, that we always uh, share with you, in dis- comparing December 2017 and December 2018, right, just a comparison, pending sales were down 17%. New listings were down 14%. Mm. The average days in the market was up 18%. Uh, the available homes per buyer, that's, you know, we talk about that all the time, was up 60%. Uh, and the month's supply of inventory uh, was up 71% wow. <laughs> in December. But that, that doesn't mean the sky is anywhere near falling. What that means is that we're getting closer to a normal market uh, in terms of month supply and, and that kind of thing. But we're seeing more, uh, more new listings coming on. I'll bet you we're over that 1,000 mark. I'll bet you by... I bet you by summer it could be very well around 13, 1,300. I wouldn't bet against that. We're I, right on a steady climb. Yeah. And, and that has generated, like I said, and uh, my, my own personal activity uh-huh. has been uh, up showing houses because the new ones are coming out, and yeah. we're taking a look as soon as we can. The rate, okay, the, the valuation, up overall, <clears throat> overall in Jackson County was up 6% in 2018. All right? That varies by town. Three, from 3% in Ashland to 21% in Jacksonville. You know, so it, it varies, but 6% is a okay rise. Southwest Medford? What do you want? You want Southwest Medford? Let me see. Southwest Medford, uh, 8.2%. Yeah, we had one of our better years. Our county valuations yeah. reflected that yeah. as well. New construction was actually down, you know, for the year. Mm. Uh, although they, they went up, that's where the problem. It's up 11%. Uh, in the median price in, in new construction. So the median price now is 343000 and that eliminates a lot of people yeah. right off the bat. It, it really does. Yeah. But uh, rural properties, as we uh, talked uh, last week, also are, uh, they rose only 5%. So they were actually less after that we talked about with Jack. The run-up with marijuana and cannabis, and I'm sure your office <laughs> saw the that same kind of it, it was literally for, the next day. The phone rang off the, the next wow, day. Wow. My the, partner Chris was inundated with his yeah. planning work. And how different that has become now. Here we are a few days later, a few years later, and we see abandoned places, abandoned uh, uh, cannabis farms, Market abandoned dynamics, some kind of places as it's changed. Yep. Tell us about estate planning because you know we're all baby boomers, and there's a lot of boomers out there. There's lots of people our age, a lot of younger people. And you think, when do I need to look at estate planning, or why is it important, especially if I own real estate? So what do you say to people when they come to you, or how do you deal with that? What do we do? Well, people tend to come to me when they're in older. Trouble. <laughs> older. Okay, I was going to say in trouble. Okay. <laughs> it was wonderful when a, uh, a classmate of my daughter's, uh, who I'd known when she was four years old, called me when she was 27, uh-huh, and yeah. she wanted me to write a will for her. She okay. had a, two young children and was married, and that was pretty cool to have someone of my daughter's generation, my daughter was two years old when we moved to Mm -hmm. Ashland, um, that I was able to help this kid who's now an adult um, do do the planning. And that's a really good time to get started. Certainly, at least if you have children, you really should have a plan in place for what's gonna happen with your property in the event that you you pass away Mm -hmm. at that young age or any time in the future, a foreseeable future. Um, as life changes, the need to change your estate plan um, occurs from time to time because people mm-hmm. die, people get born, your financial circumstances can change. So there can be a lot of triggers for having to redo a plan that you've already done. But there's so many people that have done nothing. They've done and, nothing. And, and there's just a, nobody wants to come and sit down with a lawyer or anybody else and talk about, well, what's going to happen when I die? Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's a psychological <laughs> reluctance to oh, spend yeah. time a, doing yeah. that. Call it a buzzkill. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know, we don't yeah, want, we don't want to talk yeah. about it, but let's face it, uh, you better, because what happens... It's one certainty. That well, there's okay, the old what, saying, all death and taxes, right? right? So that, That's right. And, and, if you own, and if you own property, you know, you, you what happens if... Okay. So what, what happens if you die and you got nothing? Uh, well, lots you got no will, you got no estate, you got no trust, nothing. From an estate planning standpoint, a person who dies and they're insolvent, they don't own anything, uh, or they don't have any value in their estate, and there are some people sure. in that circumstance, for sure. Um, I I don't see them. I, okay. Their families don't come to see they're me. They're not going to see you. But, but I, I, I think what happens, Pete, is that in most circumstances, nothing happens. 
because there, there really isn't but anything I, but, to be but, taken care but what of. If other I, own, than, okay, I understand, but what if I own property? Now, if you own property, die, okay. that's, that's a different because matter. Because the issue is always, remember, as from our guests that we've had in the past, remember, you have to be able to transfer title to property. And if you're dead, you can't transfer that you, title. Isn't that right? It's, you're, it's it real work. tough to sign a deed if <laughs> you, you're dead. You can't yes. even doc okay. sign. I mean, <clears throat> so, so, <laughs> yeah, the, do, the electronic signature does not work. Yeah. So, okay. it, so the, the reason that um, it, planning needs to occur, and it can be by writing a will or it can be by creating a trust, mm -hmm. and, and the discussion about that takes some time. I don't know if we have time to even get into that, but <clears throat> a, a real property has a document of title called a deed, and it's the deed that reflects your ownership of the property. It, when you die owning a piece of property, um, now it's sitting there, it's owned by you, you've died. Who's going to sign the deed to transfer ownership of that property to somebody else? Right. The, the way that happens for somebody that only has a will or doesn't even have a will or a trust is we have a statutes about intestacy, about mm -hmm. intestate succession. That's the term for someone who dies without a will. Their estate has to be probated, which mm -hmm. means someone has to step up and f file a petition file with petition. the court to get a probate case pay, going. No, someone's got to pay for all of this There's as a well. filing fee. Of, do, do, okay, let me ask yeah. you, it, it, is it smarter if a person owns property, owns a home, maybe a vacation, if you own property, are you smarter would you recommend that you do a will or do a trust? What's easier at the end for the family? I think most of the time a trust is probably easier. Okay. Although <clears throat> I think some of my brethren give seminars and perhaps tell don't, people don't. that everybody should have a trust. And uh -huh. I've not been to them, so maybe that's not a fair characterization of what okay. they do. But I, I counsel lots of people every year about this, and a trust is appropriate for a very large percentage of people. There's mm -hmm. certain people that for various reasons it's not appropriate or okay, necessary sure. for them to have a trust. Um, the basic idea behind having a trust is you set up this separate entity and it, you transfer ownership of your possessions into, into it, including your real estate if you right. have and real estate. And that allows my executor to sign for me after I'm well, dead, not correct? Your, or, your, your, the, your, the successor trustee, the trustee, person who's right. running the trust after you're not running it right, anymore. Right, right. Um, th this is a really important point to make about real estate. Um, so if you live in Oregon and you own property here and you also own property in California, so okay. <clears throat> and you die here in Oregon with just having a will, say. Okay. Well, there'll be a probate of your estate in Oregon. But there's also then going to have to be a probate in California, California where you own real estate there because there's no one authorized out of this probate to transfer title to real oh, estate in another sense. state. Yeah. So there, because each state has exclusive jurisdiction over the real property within its borders right. and no jurisdiction over any other real estate anywhere else. So if you own property in two states, I'm hearing you say, you're going to generally have to probate them out. Yes. I had a, a client who came to me. She'd done a, a homemade trust agreement, and it was actually not a bad one, mm -hmm. but she came to me for a particular reason about wanting to change one thing and discuss that. And then I just offhandedly asked her if she actually had transferred title to her six parcels of real estate in five different states and one <laughs> other country, uh -huh. British oh, right. Columbia, Canada. Yeah, yeah, good question. Imagine that. That's, yeah. good. That's a good one. So she thought that the schedule on her, um, on her trust that listed all these properties was a sufficient transfer. And I had to explain to her, no. Nope. It doesn't um, do so that. all of you own all of those properties still. They're not in the trust, and so then we fortunately we had time to yeah, get all those so. titles changed yeah. so that the trust then owned them. So the the idea there is that when someone dies, having a trust which owns all the real estate in however many states there, mm -hmm. there may be, the successor trustee has complete authority to sell those properties or distribute them uh, right. to beneficiaries right, without you, a court right, you can getting sell, involved. You, can, you don't have to, pro, you can sell them, you can distribute right. them and that whole kind of thing there. And, and that's one of the principal reasons why people set up trusts is to avoid having to have the probate process. And they're coming, and they, you're seeing mostly uh, older people coming in at the towards the end of, of their experience. Yes, because people just don't get around to it. They don't yeah. think they need it. They don't yeah. want to spend the money. 
Yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people don't get to it. But I think the main one is is the mortality issue of not wanting to have to Fa- talk yeah. about that. Face yeah, of, fa- think about that. Face our own mortality is, is, um, is not, uh, not, it's not the most fun topic you ever want to face. But, but for your family, yourself, yeah. well, for, I mean, for, if, for, if yeah. you have a family and you've got kids in, 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 in properties and things like that, Man, you, you really do need Don't to Don't make take care them of that. deal with that. Yeah. Be in front, have it set to where well, it's easier, and, and easier yet, for them to deal yes, with. They still have to deal with it. And yet I'm them. amazed how many clients I see who do who are who are in that boat. Why well, leave people in a room. They real really work. are. Well, it, it, people make a lot of assumptions about how things are gonna happen and it's, and particularly when things don't happen the way you expect. People die at a young age or mm-hmm. these things badly, happen that, yeah. Yeah. that that aren't likely to happen, but they do happen. Um I, I want to make one other point about planning. It's called estate planning, and whether you own real estate or not, it's really important when, as a family, people can see that grandma or grandpa are, is starting to slip mentally, mm-hmm. and it's really hard for people to face the fact that that's happening and get in and make plans while it's still possible. Because well, I've, well, I've, I've had many people that were brought to important. my office who really weren't, they were, I call it the slippery slope, and they're pretty far down the slippery slope, and they're really not capable of understanding or signing any decisions. legal documents yes. anymore. Yeah. And uh, planning opportunities that were otherwise available yeah. have been lost once that's, that that's happens. That's like the mortality so. issue. It's hard to confront, and it's hard to it, it's a different issue. Yeah. Step up and take and you may, it's and you very may, hard. And you may have a power of attorney, but that only, that only works up until your death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the power of attorney goes away, so... That person can't do anything for you after that. Death is inevitable, but it doesn't allow us to schedule it or plan for it (laughs) in the way we'd like to in our daily planning. We've got one more segment to go. We're with Gary Turner today, attorney here talking about estate planning, kind of issues in real estate as well. Today's show presented by the Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. Don't forget, you can check out any of our past shows at realestateshoworegonlost.com. Last week, Colin Milan was here. We talked about the stats from the year uh, and what went through that. So some good information as well uh, and some great shows coming up again. Vacation rentals, things like that. Lots going on out in the real estate market. We got a break. Coming right back, the final segment right after this. And welcome back to the Real Estate Show here on KCMX News Media 880. Pete Belcaster and Joe Brett, the real estate guys, with you today here in January as we moving right along. It's uh, it's always uh, always interesting. Each year, you know, we've been doing this since 2009, Joe. So you know, we've been almost 10 years here of, uh, of of shows, and it's funny with Gary Turner here as an attorney today with us uh, uh, talking about. You know issues that come up that attorneys get involved with. When do you need an attorney in real estate? So far, we've learned easement issues. We've learned about uh, uh, estate, some estate planning, uh, boundary disputes, and how those get resolved. And uh, you want to get them resolved before you have to go in and basically see you. But then Gary wouldn't have a business, and so that would not be good for him. Despite despite (laughs) the fact that real estate contracts are written really soundly to. not have to get to the point of litigation if people execute and the parties uh, adhere to their part in the in the agreement. But yeah. inevitably, uh, we we do have to have legal advice, and legal issues are yeah. are, are part of the deal sometimes. Okay. One of the things for you is that uh, Gary is a uh, transferring title. Uh, we've had you know we've been, uh, uh, title companies have come in you know and we talk about yeah. transferring title, uh, but that can be that can be a problem. It, you know. It can be a problem, but it's something for all buyers uh, to to think about. How do they want to take title to their property? Okay. Um, if you have a revocable trust in place, you're going to want to take title in the names of the trustees of that trust, the trustees. so that the trust becomes the owner. Uh, well, we see that a lot. I, mean, I, yeah. I, I see <clears throat> you know, trustees uh, uh, on on documents a lot uh, from people. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I don't know what percentage of deeds I see that have been generated in the last 20 years that have trusts as owners but it's it's increased it's, it's got to be at least between a third and a half i, I haven't yeah. tried to keep track of it you that's just my sense of, of it people, yeah. yeah yeah i always thought so, that but so so we, so, the, so the way you want it, the, there's only so many ways to take title and and if if you want to put the ownership into the trust then you do it the way i just said okay. there are some issues for married persons to think about um and maybe talk to a lawyer about because if you own property as husband and wife rather than in your trust, um, that's a form call of ownership called tenancy by the entireties. Mm-hmm. It's 
It's a form of title that only married persons can hold together. Right. And among other things, that, it, it, that form of ownership gives certain asset protection okay. to the non-debtor spouse uh, in the event that um, there's a claim made against one of the spouses. Mm -hmm. Um, and you lose that if you if you put that property into the trust, and then there's a claim. Oh, then it's okay. it's it's available to be mm -hmm. levied right. upon uh, by a claim against either sp a claimant right. against either spouse. W what happens uh, divorces in real estate? I've, I've well, I, I, I've I've got one right <clears throat> now, but I'm dealing with some with some folks on that kind of a thing. But divorces also kind of play in here, don't they? Somewhere in terms of real estate and how they transfer and all this kind of stuff. Can the two sides just agree to do it, or do you have to go to, tell me what that's like? Well, in divorces, it's sometimes the court will award a piece of property to one spouse or the other. Okay, right. Sometimes they'll the court will order as part of the judgment that the property be, be sold, sold, right, and as yeah. the proceeds divided, or you know, the, the, there could be endless sure. arrangements about what happens to the money that's mm -hmm. available when the property's sold. Um, there are potential problems with that kind of an arrangement. Um, I just litigated a case a couple of years ago where husband and wife got divorced. He stayed in the house. He was supposed to sell it. And 10 years later, she he's, walked into my office saying, well, you know, I he need still to. still hasn't sold the house. He hasn't sold the house. Um, <laughs> so it's a problematic uh, situation sometimes. And uh, I want to get back to the forms of ownership because. Okay. Uh, but this is something that people, I think, make assumptions about. They'll, for instance, they own a piece of property and then they'll put a child in title with them. Right, okay. Thinking, all right, that's that's the way we're going to resolve right. this. I want that child to get this property and I'm going to die first because I'm older. Mm -hmm. And so they think that part of their plan is done. Mm -hmm. And that, that will work if the people die in the right order. Right. Mm -hmm. That will work if no disputes Come up, occur uh, between the the, 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 the the parent and the child about right. how, who's paying for what because once you put somebody in title, they can also borrow money against it. Um, they can do well, lots of things. It's 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 often difficult for one co-owner to borrow against property when the other co-owner doesn't. And most banks yeah. won't right. let okay. you do that. Yeah. Maybe private parties would. The mm -hmm. banks I don't think will. Mm -hmm. um, it once you start messing around with those kinds of assumptions and making those arrangements, you are assuming things are going to happen a certain way. And yeah. I'd be willing to bet that 90% of the time or more, people haven't thought of a number of downsides to, to making those arrangements. Mm -hmm. Seeing a lawyer when you're contemplating doing something like that can mm -hmm. really help you avoid getting into a situation that you never envisioned and that you really don't want to find yourself we in. Talk and about and that. Rarely, rarely could, could someone have the expertise to draw that up to protect and to execute their wishes and their intentions properly. Well, th there are there are ways to document and draft documents to to bring into being whatever the agreement is, but the first step is to understand what it is, what are the ramifications of doing what you're contemplating mm -hmm. doing. And most most people can't possibly know what right. they all are because um, they're not lawyers. And we've mm -hmm. learned from our tax and our yeah. rental owners, laws change every year, and to keep up with that and to stay up with that is very important. Uh, and well, in co-signing with your children is another issue. That, it's against uh, that. That that can happen or co-signing <laughs> well, things right. like this. But what I heard you say you're when you're signing or you're going to put title onto a property or, or there's two different ways of doing that. You can do it, husband and wife can do that together, or you put it into your trust name. And there's different variations of that. Though. Each one of them is, means something different. Correct. And yeah, there okay. are other ways to do it. You okay. and I could buy a piece of property together. Together, Pete, right. And we would probably take title as tenants in common. Okay. So that if one of us died, our estate would own the other half, the right. decedent's right. half. Right. And you would, you would have the other half. Right, right. And um, there are lots of properties that are owned in that way manner. Lot, yes. the, the other way is to take it in a form of survivorship so that if you and I bought it together and we said we're taking title not as tenants in, tenants in common but with right of survivorship, yeah. now if I die you're 100% owner of the property Damn automatically the property. by operation of law mm -hmm. we say don't have to go to court to have a court mm -hmm. say so. It you just see, you see happens. Does that happen very often anymore, that kind of a thing? 
Uh, survivorship yeah. fund? Yes, very it frequently. Does. Okay. Yes. Oh, I, I, was, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Gary did that. really well on the real estate test, by the way. You, you, you passed your broker <laughs> test. <laughs> you're, 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 I'm hearing a lot of the terms that we learned about and studied about. And, uh, Haven't we today? No, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More more so than I think any guest we've ever had, the, those, those terms, <laughs> the, those definitions yeah. uh, that, you were, that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. We're, 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 you pick up a few things along the way when I, you've done you, this we're, as we're long as I have. We're perceiving that. Yeah, yeah. Clearly. We're almost out of time here. So, what else? I mean, anything else you got to, the bottom line is if, if, if you're in trouble, or if you think you're going to get in trouble before you get in trouble, uh, again. Or if you're just not sure. Yeah. Do it. It's and, well and worth it. it. I mean, it's so worth it to get a hold of an, of an attorney of a property or an who can guide you in what to do. You know, at least, you, at least you're going to make a smart decision. And that's our whole thing is making a smart real estate decision, especially in this type of thing, because this is serious stuff here. Well, if, if you, it's not documented, you, you're out. You, you're going to lose and, and that kind of thing. If you don't, um, there, there are so many times when getting the advice at the front end um, won't cost very much, and the failure yeah. to get the advice problem cost, comes up wow. later cost the, the cost of dealing with it when it's a problem is 10 20 yeah. 30 yep. times All what the things. front end cost All might right. be to get the advice so lots lots of we got a time we got to go so gary turner thank you for coming uh again uh, again you, you can google him and you can find him it's easy it's easy to get a hold of right garrison turner I, my dad gave me that name and garrison. it's an old family name yeah garrison. garrison turner you can find him google him and you can find him he can certainly help you out. That's going to do it for the Real Estate Show here today. Thank you for joining us. We're back next week. We'll talk about mortgage interest rates here in 2019. Guy Giles will be here. We'll see what's going on with them. In the meantime, have a great week, everybody. For Joe, I'm Pete Belcaster. Have a great week. We'll see you next Saturday, and God bless you all.